Hello, lovely listener. I'm your host, Lindsay, and you're listening to Two Cents Podcast, your audible anthology. Over a year ago, much of our livelihoods were flipped with the advent of COVID-19. Lockdowns began across the world, which had much social impact. One social problem that has been on the rise is loneliness, and that is the feeling or experience we will be inquiring on this episode through poetry, of course. In Julie fashion, cue the intro. Before I begin, I'd just like to wish you an extremely overdue belated World Poetry Day. And I give much thanks to my friend Talia, who indirectly informed me of this important day. The 21st of March, if you were wondering, so go ahead and save the date. We'll celebrate it properly next year. I'd like to mention that the subject of this episode was mostly inspired by a video I put out not too long ago. I'd been wanting to make something like it for a while, and I'm still reminiscing over how it came to be. It was an interesting experience, and side note, if you wanted to try out something creatively, this is your sign to go ahead. Even if it doesn't turn out the way you want, failure will always champion regret. So, yes. Not too long ago, I was overwhelmed with loneliness, and navigating it was a challenge. Looking back on it, I see it as a feeling of seclusion whilst having the desire to connect with others. The isolation thrived because of negative self-talk, which hindered me from taking the leap and reaching out to others. But then again, in context of the times we're in, are we as willing to get out of our shells? I definitely think that our circumstances have had significant pushback on our social abilities. After all, speaking behind a mask isn't the easiest thing, well, from my experience. And though my view is subjective, I'm sure it can be agreed that loneliness is an emotional experience or response we're all familiar with. A writer named Hot Doodler from Poetizer, which is a poetry sharing app, wrote a poem titled Solitary Person. The poem reasons out the feeling of loneliness beautifully. It reads like a soliloquy, personal and sensitive, yet bleak and sort of hopeless. I will read it to you now. I live, yet I live not. What is this thing called happiness that so long ago I forgot? I continue drifting on and on wondering wherever I go. Why this pain is haunting me, would I ever know? Alone upon this world, the future I cannot see. This is what this thing called life has only brought to me. I reach out with that solitary hand no one wants to hold. I reach across to the seat beside, but it is only cold. This is what I offer. Nothing else I know could be. The person stranded by herself was always going to be me. The speaker has ended her poem, acknowledging that regardless of what she does, she is disposed to being alone. She'll reach out her hand for contact, but receives none. The seat beside her remains empty and has even become cold by extension lifeless. She asks many times in the beginning very pessimistic questions, suggesting that her solitude is pain. She asks, quote, I continue drifting on and on, wondering wherever I go. Why this pain is haunting me, would I ever know? It's clear that loneliness is a great burden on her, and it challenges her outlook on life. Because without companionship, her innate ability to extend care to someone or others is starved, which makes her question living and her purpose at large. I think the lines, quote, I live, yet I live not, 
and I continue drifting on and on, wandering wherever I go. Spell out the depths of her loneliness and how, because of it, she seems to be going through life aimlessly. This moves me to my next point. Loneliness can become chronic when it feels fixed, like it'll never change. It definitely affects how we view relationships as well as our suitability to engage in them. An idea that has been held for a long time is that loneliness is to be expected, especially as we get older. Think of the number of elderly citizens where you live. Most of them are in homes or have nurses or aides. And their predicament is just a way of life. Of course, there are many factors to this. I know in more developed nations, the ratio of birth to death is a common cause of having a lot of old people under the care of helpers and so on. So I found two poems connected to loneliness in their own way. But the reason why I'm grouping them together is because they have that wise and matured tone that fits well with the little bit I said on the elderly and how loneliness is something that prevails as we get older. The two poems are On the Beach at Night Alone by Walt Whitman and Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Whitman's piece is the one we're dealing with first and the tone is very existential yet stoic. Stoic, I think. Yeah, stoic. And in my mind, I find that to be a bit of a contradiction because existentialism can get so multifaceted and overwhelming whereas stoicism is very leveled and forbearing lovely listeners here is on the beach at night alone on the beach at night alone as the mother sways her to and fro singing a husky song as i watch the bright stars shining i think a thought of the cleft of the universes and of the future. A vast similitude interlocks all. All spheres, grown and grown, small, large, suns, moons, planets. All distances of place, however wide. All distances of time, all inanimate forms, all souls, all living bodies, though they be ever so different or in different worlds all gaseous, watery, vegetable, mineral processes, the fishes, the brutes, all nations, colors, barbarisms, civilizations, languages, all identities that have existed or may exist on this globe or any globe, all lives and deaths, all of the past, present, future. This vast similitude spans them and has always spanned and shall forever span them and compactly hold and enclose them. The speaker starts out alone on the beach. Despite being in the presence of his mother, he is alone within himself. It reminds me of this quote and it's kind of cringe, <laughs> but it goes, have you ever felt alone? in a crowded room. Granted, he's not in a crowded room, but that's the feeling I'm getting. As his mother is nearby doing a thing, singing her song, he sinks deeper into his observations. Quote, I watch the bright stars shining, and I think a thought of the cleft of the universes and of the future. The clef of the universe is such a mind-boggling string of words because clefs on a music sheet are placed at the beginning of a stave. They introduce the hand that will be playing and the pitch of the notes to follow. So they are a small yet significant part of the music sheet. When I think of the universe, I struggle to finish thinking about it because it's so vast. And the fact that our universe isn't the only one and belongs to a galaxy among other galaxies, takes the clef of the universes to a new level. 
The speaker lists any, any and everything in the world around us, but to him, it is a mere clef among the universes, and I must agree. I love the way the poem has an encircling narrative. We start the second sections with the vast similitude that interlocks all, and we end with the vast similitude that not only interlocks and spans, but also encloses all. The features of this vast similitude are outlined in their domains, which simplifies our existence, and I think for a good cause. The repetition of the word all at the beginning of each list is anaphora, and it emphasizes that everything, regardless of what it is, is interlocked, spanned, and enclosed into a great whole, whole with a W. I think it's true that our existence can be boiled down to our nations, civilizations, and barbarisms. After all, the things that sustain us are simply gaseous, watery, vegetable, and mineral processes. The fact that he's simplifying it all also deflates the existential brand of such a contemplation. At the end of the day, life, stuff, and things can be condensed into categories and maybe don't need to be as abstract or you know, complicated as we tend to make them out to be. Now, what does this have to do with loneliness? Well, despite all we went, all he went about, um, the speaker was lonely from the start. Again, it's the whole feeling alone in a r crowded room concept. He speaks of this vast similitude and everything in it from the outside looking in whilst still being a part of it. Basically, he is observing. He is present, but not necessarily engaging, which leaves him in this secluded state, kind of like an island. On linking it to the bit I said about the elderly, I honestly think that this is the, this is the kind of sentiment you'd get from an old person after all the life they've lived. Having gone through the happy-go-lucky phase of childhood, to the soul-searching and crisis-filled stages of their adolescence and adulthood, decades upon decades of thinking could produce this observant and present, yet less engaged person or personality. But of course, I don't limit the outlook to the seniors in our society. Anyone can have an on-the-beach-at-night-alone moment. Next, we have Solitude by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. And she published this poem in 1883 to the New York Sun. Wilcox was an avid reader and writer for most of her life. She was 14 when her first work was published. It was a sketch. And soon after, her poems landed the pages of weekly publications. Her most notable work, called Poems of Passion, was said to be unconventional for the time because of the carnal verses. It got rejected at first by some publishers for being immoral, before it was published elsewhere and blew up, selling 60,000 copies in two years. Remember, this is the late 1800s. The first lines of Solitude were written after an experience she had as she was traveling to a governor's inaugural celebration in Madison, which is the capital city of the state of Wisconsin. When she was on her way to the inaugural celebration, she sat an aisle across a woman dressed in black who was weeping. She felt compelled to comfort her, and did so till she arrived in Madison. Upon her arrival, her mood was completely dampened, and she couldn't enjoy the celebration at all. In a moment of reflection, no pun intended, she looked at her face in the mirror, and all she could see was the weeping woman, which birthed solitude, which I will read to you now. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth, but has trouble enough on its own. Sing, and the hills will answer. Sigh, it is lost on the air. The echoes bound to a joyful sound, but shrink from voicing care. Rejoice, and men will seek you. Grieve, and they turn and go. 
They want full measure of all your pleasure, but they do not need your woe. Be glad, and your friends are many. Be sad, and you lose them all. There are none to decline your nectared wine, but alone you must drink life's gall. Feast, and your halls are crowded. Fast, and the world goes by. Succeed and give, and it helps you live, but no man can help you die. There is room in the halls of pleasure for a large and lordly train, but one by one we must all file on through the narrow aisles of pain. First of all, let's talk about the rhyme scheme because it is just excellent. I thoroughly enjoyed reading the 3rd, 7th, 11th, 15th and 19th lines because of the amazing internal rhyme. And it's so constant throughout the poem, so it creates this beautiful song-like rhythm. Take another listen. For the sad old earth must borrow its mirth. They want full measure of all your pleasure. There are none to decline your nectared wine. Succeed and give, and it helps you live. These lines are followed by statements that reinforce the speaker's point, which I think is found in the cliched saying, when the days are dark, the friends are few. As the speaker says, laugh and the world laughs with you. Weep and you weep alone. Rejoice and men will seek you. Grieve and they turn and go. I don't think this poem is meant to be spiteful about this truth. Rather, it's just telling human nature like it is. Struggle is not nice. It is repelling, in fact. And we plan out most of our lives to try and avoid it where we can. And if we do end up struggling, it is almost most likely a lonesome battle. But what if, even in times of plenty, we are still alone, but just occupied with positive things, such as the feast, nectared wine, rejoicing in song? At a feast in the company of others, you are an individual. When your effort leads to success and you give to others, you have succeeded and given as an individual, which is no different to when you fast or pray, when you weep or take your last breath. It's just that in the latter moments, you feel vulnerable, which makes the loneliness settle in harsher. On a lighter note, I think that loneliness can be a remarkable experience. Take the last stanza in the poem, Eating Alone, by Li Young Li, for example. I love it so much because it's so simple and serene, and the scene he illustrates is just so satisfying. Quote, White rice steaming, almost done. Sweet green peas, fried in onions. Shrimp braised in sesame oil and garlic and my own loneliness. What more could I, a young man, want?" End quote. You know that satisfying feeling when you're in the comfort of loneliness, maybe accompanied by a book or a meal. You probably don't feel lonely, but you are in essence alone. And I think the speaker does a great job of showing how fulfilling loneliness can be. Ending. What more could I, a young man, want? He's got himself and his food on the hob. Just genuine contentedness. And I can definitely relate to that. Especially like with cooking, when you're alone. It's an awesome experience, much like any hobby you do alone. It's like the high tide of loneliness before it comes crashing down in the moments when it's not so enjoyable. However, this final piece by a poetizer writer, Madeline Shenton, can be encouraging for a time when loneliness is more bitter than sweet and more cold than comforting. If you feel this way, regardless of how often 
I repeat the title to you. The sun knows what it's like to walk alone. And it reads. The next time you see the sun shine through the window glass, remember, even he stands and sets alone. Do not be afraid if it is only you who walks today. Remember that your loneliness is not fixed. It is bound to change. Till then, ride its wave as best as you can. Savor these solitary moments. Because one day, there'll be a little cliff. Well, cleft, sorry. In comparison to all you experienced. And that brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you giving your time. If this is your first listen, I hope this was impressionable enough for you to join me again for another episode. If you're returning, your loyalty is unmatched. (laughs) Seriously, I've been gone for a while and it is received with so much gratitude. As always, my email is open for any further discussions on a topic, episode suggestions, and even submissions. If you'd like more, You can check out the mini blog post where I discuss episode cover art. Please give the YouTube channel a subscribe and the podcast's Instagram a follow where I notify when a new episode is out. Till next time.